So I love it when we get to start a brand new series together. I'm always a little freaked out when we start a brand new series as well, though, because you, you don't quite know what's going to happen. I mean, you know what the text says, but you're, you, we start these series and it's always like, Lord, what are you going to do? And I know for me, we've been traveling together here in the middle of the week through the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible now for five years. I think my hair grew about three feet since we started. (laughs) And God has done a lot in us. And now we begin this next section in the Old Testament, these historical books that we know as the book of Joshua. Now, what's powerful about the book of Joshua is God has a timing for things. And God's timing is often never our timing. But God is always faithful to his timing for when he wants to bring certain things to pass. See, we're at a point right now in the history of the children of Israel where God is going to fulfill promises that he made hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. Now, I know that's hard for some of us because there's things that you're waiting for, that you're hoping for, things that you want to see happen, and they haven't happened yet. And you have to remember that God's timing is always the right time. So rather than giving you a lot of background, open up in your Bibles to the book of Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, as we begin The book of Joshua, this first series in this book that we're calling Conquest. If you're new to the Bible, it's the sixth book in your Bible. You have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then, of course, the book of Joshua. So it's towards the beginning of your Bible. On my Bible, it's page 190. So so it's just, it's towards the beginning of the Bible here. So just jumping right on in, look what it says in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over the Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you All the days of your life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, verse 6. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Talk about a powerful beginning. See, these opening words, these first, I just read nine verses of Joshua chapter one. It begins with, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant saying. So we realize that at this point, Moses has now moved off of the scene. And you have to realize that Moses was, next to the Lord himself, Moses was the centerpiece of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? In the lineage of the the children of Israel, you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you have Joseph in a sense, and then you have Moses. 
And now all of a sudden we find Moses has left the scene. And Moses is called here the servant of the Lord. Now, that's a pretty powerful title. It's used all through the scriptures, really. Abraham's called the servant of the Lord. King David's called servant of the Lord. But let's never forget the fact that Jesus actually invites us to an even greater relationship than just servant of the Lord, because he said, I have called you what? Friends. How powerful is that? See, we get to be friends of God. When was the last time someone asked you, hey, so what are you all about? You said, well, I'm a friend of Jesus. We should use that language, I think, shouldn't we? You, you want to be the kind of person, I'm a friend of Jesus. Because that is exactly what God did for us through Jesus. He invited us to be family, to be close. Not just a, a position of servant, but the intimacy that comes from friendship. And Moses is called the servant, but now what we learn is it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Now first, Joshua, the son of Nun, Nun is his father's name, not he's not the child of somebody who's nobody, okay? Because there's, there's a bad biblical joke about Joshua being the son of Nun. So what's the only biblical person who's got no parents? Joshua, he's the son of Nun. So cheesy, you can share it with your Christian friends. They'll think it's funny. Your non-Christian friend will just think it's a lame joke. Anyway, but Joshua's family, his dad's his name was Nun. People aren't really using that too much anymore, but you might want to bring it back if you're having a boy. But what we learn here is Joshua was Moses' assistant. Now, of course, we've seen that all the way through the story of Moses, that Joshua was the guy who wherever Moses was, Joshua wanted to be. See, because Moses spent time in the presence of God, and because Moses was allowed to be there, Joshua was like, I just want to be with Moses because Moses is in the presence of God. And really what we see here is the idea in the Bible of discipleship, it really speaks of apprenticeship. When you think about somebody who is apprenticing for something, you link yourself with somebody who is really good at something, and as they're doing it, they allow you to see how it all works, and they allow you to be a part of it, and then with you being a part of it, at some point, you begin to take on the skills because you've been apprenticed into this position. That's exactly what happened to Joshua. Joshua got to be in the presence of God because God was doing a work through Moses and as experiencing that over time, now all of a sudden, Moses' servant, the guy who is Moses' companion, who is always with Moses, now he's ready to take the next step. He moves from being the apprentice to being the leader. Now, that's kind of a lost art in our day and age because we live in a day and age where everyone wants everything super fast, we have the whole situation now where people come out of college and they think they're supposed to be the CEO because they got a college degree, right? Like nobody wants to like learn. Everyone's like, I, I got a degree in this. I know how it's supposed to work. But the Bible still loves this lost art of discipleship. Life upon life. The things that Joshua learned watching Moses. Wow. We see them on display all through this book. I look at my own life. I so am grateful to the Lord for my pastor, Pastor John Henry Corcoran. I brought him up to speak, you know, about a year ago. I got to spend time with him a couple of weeks back. It's amazing how much of what I understand about Jesus and ministry I learned from this one man who allowed me to learn the ministry. I remember when I first started serving alongside my pastor, and I remember he said, okay, we're going to go to the hospital now. I'm like, wait, what are we going to do? We're going to go to the hospital. I'm like, are you sick? He's like, no. I'm like, am I sick? He's like, well, it's debatable, but we're not going for any of those reasons. He's like, we have to go visit someone in the hospital. And I'm like, okay. You know, and I'm like all eager beaver, like ready to go, like do something. I get in the car. I'm like, so what am I supposed to do? And he says, nothing. That's what he said. He said, if they say hi, say hi. Don't say anything. Just watch. Just watch. Right? And so I was like the little, like, you know, the guy in my password walk, and I was just, you know. And, 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 and I loved it because he, he didn't want me to, in my eagerness, to jump in and, and do something inappropriate. And, that. and so he brought me along. 
And I remember he stopped by the nurse's station. He said hi to everybody, introduced himself, said, hey, I'm going to see so-and-so. Is now a good time? And, he, and, and I just watch him. And then we get into the room, and, and it's someone from the congregation. And it's like, oh, Pastor John Henry, thanks for coming. I'm, how you doing? I'm not doing well at all. I mean, you were in the hospital. Oh, Daniel, it's good to see you. You know, <laughs> you didn't want to say anything. And, and, and I got a chance to watch my pastor just minister, not only to the person who was the patient, but to their family and nurses and doctors and other people. And then after we got in the car, I'm like, what just happened? And he, and he began to unpack all this stuff for me. He said, Daniel, you never do a hospital call without first checking in at the nurse's station. Why? Because they're people too. And maybe God has somebody on that floor because God wants to touch them, the nurse. He's like, don't miss the fact they're around sickness and unhealth all day long. And it's like all these things that I learned being the guy, just like, I'm his assistant. I'm just like, you know? And I'm so grateful for that. Listen, do you have somebody who walks with the Lord who you are saying, can I be a part of what God's doing? We need, we all need to learn from somebody who spends time in God's presence. And I believe that's something that God is doing here at Crossroads. We have a Connect and Serve coming up in just a couple weeks where you get to jump on in to find yourself in the middle of what God is doing, but not left up to your own devices, but in the middle of what God is doing in such a way that you get grown up, that you get to learn, that you get to make mistakes without your mistakes being catastrophic. But you get to learn because God is in the, the business of growing people up. So... Just as Moses would often be spoken to by the Lord, now Joshua is in that place. He is the person receiving from the Lord. Now, it says next, Moses, my servant, verse 2, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over the Jordan, you and all this people, to the land to which I am giving them, the children of Israel, and every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I have said to Moses, from the from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Now what's beautiful is this actually gives us the entire outline for the book of Joshua. It begins with them crossing over this Jordan. It's time for them to move past the Jordan River into the promised land. And we find this crossing the Jordan River for the first about five chapters or four and a half chapters. Verse three outlines the conquest of them taking the land that God had promised them, which leads you from the middle of chapter five all the way uh, through chapter 12. And then verse 4 implies the distribution of the land amongst all the people, which, of course, we get chapter 13 to 22. And then you have all the rest of the days of Joshua's life, which is the rest of the book. So right here in these verses, we're reminded that Moses is gone. Now, remember, Moses wasn't allowed to bring the children of Israel into the promised land, right? Because he misrepresented God when he got angry at the people, but also to have a picture that we would always know that Moses, who is a picture of the law, the law can never get you into the promised land. Being religious can't get you into the promised land. If you think about what religion is, right? Religion is a person's attempt to please God, right? And so you can look at every religion. What does it say of humanity's attempt to please God? That's religion. It's I do, God, and now I get heaven. I get nirvana. I get to be reincarnated as a butterfly or something. You know what I mean? There, there's some, I do this, and now I get this. That's religion, right? And you may say, well, so Fusco, hold on a second. Christianity is a religion too. Actually, it's really not. Because Christianity never says you need to do this, and then God is happy with you. Christianity says God sent Jesus, and God is happy in Jesus. And anyone who finds themselves in Jesus, God is happy with, because God is happy with Jesus. Does that make sense? 
Now, don't get me wrong. There's all sorts of people who practice Christianity as these are my duties to make God give me heaven because I want it. But that's not Christianity. That is not the teachings of Jesus who is the Christ. The teachings of Jesus who is the Christ is that me left up to my own devices only know rebellion against God and self-service. And because of my faith in Jesus, although my sins were as scarlet, I have been made white as snow. Although my life and your life has been a, a, rep a repetition of us trying maybe to do good things and failing in a million ways, when I and you put your faith and trust in Jesus, Jesus robes us in his righteousness. He shares his perfections with us. And when God sees us, he sees Jesus in us, and he is well pleased in us because his son is in us. And that has nothing to do with what we do. That's why people all the time, they say, I can't believe people who are Christians can do such a thing. I'm like, I can't. The Bible never says that a Christian's going to be get everything right. Christians often get a lot of things wrong. It doesn't excuse what we've gotten wrong, but we often get a lot of things wrong, and that's exactly why we believe in Jesus in the first place because we get some stuff wrong and we acknowledge, I get this stuff wrong. Now I'm not saying we should be like, well, who cares then? Because you got all sorts of books in the Bible to tell you that that's cheap grace, that's not real grace. But when you realize, when you realize Joshua had to be the person to bring the children into the promised land because the law can't get you there. And don't miss the fact, of course, the name Joshua in the Hebrew would be Yeshua, which would be what? Jesus. Yeah. It ain't by chance, my friends. This is by design. It's by design that we would always know. Now, of course, what we find, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people, into the land that I'm giving them. Now, don't forget, this land was promised to them back in Genesis chapter 15 with Abraham. So we're talking 400 and something years earlier. Now it's time. All these generations have passed. Now it's time to go in every place that the sole of your foot treads. That's gonna be yours. I gave me, I'm giving it to you. I said to Moses, this is how it's gonna work. And we get again the boundaries of the land from right where they are at the Jordan River all the way over to the great river Euphrates, which is in modern day Iraq, all the way to the Great Sea, to the Mediterranean, this huge piece of land that's been promised to them, they're supposed to go in and receive. No man, it says in verse 5, shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And what that means is that you are my chosen vehicle. Nobody's going to be able to come against you because just as Moses was my guy on the scene in my name, now you are. Now you might say, wow, cool. Joshua's blessed. But what we're going to see in a moment is that you and I are in the exact same spot. No, no, you're not called to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. But the same authority has been bestowed upon each one of us, if you're here today and you're a child of God, if you're a friend of Jesus, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, that there's an authority that has been bestowed upon you in Christ, that the same thing, that there is something that you are created for and to do, and we are just like Joshua in this way. Why? Because notice what he says in verse 5. I will never leave you nor forsake you. This idea that he's saying, my presence will always be with you. And guess what? That's exactly what Jesus said at the end of Matthew's gospel in the Great Commission. When he sent them out, he said, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I want you to teach them all the things I command you. And then lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age, it says. I just quoted Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Verse 20, when Jesus says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. See, the presence of Jesus leads us out into mission. Now, mission is the word that we use for you and I living in Christ. Because wherever you are, wherever you go, you are on mission with Jesus. 
And his presence leads us into mission. So whether, like we have a team in Lebanon, we had a bunch of our young folks from Crossroads, they call themselves UFK, they're United for the Kingdom. They were just in Africa. We have a group of people going to Montana for the Blackfeet nation trip. We got people getting ready to go to Macedonia. And each one of us goes into our community and our world every single day. You live this life. The Bible calls that being on mission. Because when Jesus is with you, God's got a greater plan than whatever it is that we think we're doing. Do you realize that? When, when you run out of TP and you got to go to the store and get that stuff, you're not just out of TP. You're not just on an errand to get toilet tissue. If you didn't know what TP was. Toilet paper to be specific. You're there because maybe God wants you to run into somebody so that you can be a minister and an ambassador of Christ. Maybe your car broke down just so you'd be in a specific situation so that God could do something. See, that's what, you're, what happens when you realize that the presence of Jesus leads us out into this world. He's, his presence makes all the difference. Now, because his presence is there, we have a repetition that begins in these next verses. Look what it says in verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to your fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you to do. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Right? And then if you go down a little bit farther in verse 9, be strong and of good courage. So brothers and sisters, what do I have to say to you about this? Be strong and of good courage. I want you to look at the person next to you and say, be strong. Go ahead, tell them. Now look at the person on the other side. Be, be very courageous, tell them. Now so I want you to tell the person on the other side, be very courageous. Turn to the other person and say, be very courageous. Go ahead, tell them. Now turn to the person on the other side and say, be very strong. Okay, to my brothers and sisters in Southwest Portland, be very strong and very courageous. To my friends online on CrossesLive.tv or Facebook Live, be strong and very courageous. Why is this so important? Because guess what? The reason most of us are not experiencing the presence of God is because we forget God is with us and we live our lives fear-based. What is God asking you to step out into? What is the thing that is in front of you that when you think about it, your stomach gets all up in knots where you're like, oh. You need to begin to preach to yourself, be strong and very courageous. Because what I've learned in my life is God is really looking for people who trust him enough to do dumb stuff in his name. <laughs> to do what makes no sense. I mean, so many things that you see in your Bible, you have God calling someone to do something that no one would ever do, that's a fool's errand, but God loves people who are willing to be fools in his name because when we step out, God does something. But what happens is, is, for many of us, we're too smart for our own good. We think ourselves right out of the very things God wants us to do. We think to ourselves, who am I to do this? Like the Gideon complex, I'm the least of the least of the least. I mean, why me? Well, because you're the least of the least of the least. Remember Moses, when, when God called him, Moses was like, you can't send me, God, why? I stutter. Get, get my brother Aaron. That didn't help very much, right? It's, it's, the, it's the excuses. Am I the only one who knows what it's like when you sense God calling, you have all the excuses? Go ahead, raise your hand. It's church, be honest. You guys in Southwest Portland too, raise your hand. I see you guys over there. That's right. Listen. But these words over and over and over again. Be strong. Be of good courage. I've always said it. When the Holy Spirit is redundant, when he repeats himself, it's because he knows we're thick-headed, like all you wives with your husbands, right? You know you got to tell him five times. He won't remember. On the sixth time, he might get it. Right? Can I get an amen? Amen. All the guys are like, Go. Stop it. Listen, over and over and over again, be strong. 
Be very courageous. I believe that every single day, God invites us to take steps of faith that we wouldn't normally take. That's right. Here at Crosses, we always say, we want to be simply responding to Jesus. Why? Because that is the Christian life. Every day, Jesus is saying, who will come when I change the world? Who wants to be there? Who wants to find themselves in the middle of something that they would have never chosen before? And the people who were crazy would be like, the eager beavers, I'll do it. They find themselves there. And sometimes we aren't eager, but we're like, I better go there anyway, because if I don't, I feel like I'm sinning against God. And then you show up and all of a sudden you find yourself in the middle of the most extraordinarily challenging but beautiful things. Why? Because God's presence is there. So brothers and sisters, take the step of faith. Yeah, you're freaked out. Sure, be strong and very courageous. You don't know how it's going to work. Amen, but be strong and very courageous. You think this might go really bad and guess what? It might, but guess what? Be strong and very courageous. Why? Because I will be with you and I won't forsake you wherever you go. That's what he says. What I've learned is that when you step out in the name of Jesus into what God is doing, yes, it might all crash and burn, but where Jesus is, the crash and burn is a great party. But do you believe that? See, it's a, it's, we're blessed in this culture. I'm, gr I'm grateful to have been grown up in this environment, but guess what? We don't know how to take holy risks anymore. We're too good at pro and con charts, you know, making sure the pluses and the minuses, you know, we count the costs right out of faith in God. And I think God wants to change that in all of us. Will you take God at his word? I'll be honest with you. Oftentimes, I'll love it. I'll meet someone. I just met someone this weekend here at Crossroads. They're like, how in God's name are you the pastor in this place? <laughs> and I started laughing. I said, well, look, I'm not the pastor. There's a lot of us pastors. And I'm like, but ain't it a trip? And they're like, they're like, yeah, I mean, like Bill Ritchie. And like, what was he thinking? I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, they said, you want to be here? I said, sure, let's do it. But do you think I wasn't freaked out? I was super freaked out. I remember, I'll never forget, on the first, when we moved into town, I mean, so I'd already gotten hired and everything. And I remember the first morning I was going to come into the office, I looked at Lynn and I was like, how are you? She's like, I'm like, I'm totally freaking out. There's all these people at the office. I'd only been a church planner. I'd go into the office, the only person who was there was me. You know what I mean? When I got lonely, I'd go out have office at the coffee shop with all these people. They weren't there to see me. They weren't working with me, but they were there. I'm like, okay, I feel better now. And I remember the first day I came to the Crossroads office, I bought like five dozen donuts. Because when I get nervous, I eat like everyone else. You know what I mean? I'm like, if, if, if no one likes me, at least I sugared them up for a little bit. And Lynn's like, I'm not used to seeing you nervous. I'm like, well, I'm freaking out right now. What if I can't do this job? I mean, like, I mean, like, what do I know? And I share that not to be glory to God, I, I, not to puff myself up. I was just dumb enough to keep showing up. I still joke every time I go on a, on a trip to go preach somewhere, I always come back and I always expect when I take the key out that the key won't open the door. <laughs> and literally, if one day I show up to Crossroads and I put the key in and it doesn't open and all the keys don't work, I'll be like, they finally got smart. You know, they got, they got themselves a real pastor, you know. But... Brothers and sisters, we need to learn how to be strong and very courageous. Some of us are so timid when God is saying, sure, like for Joshua, they're going into a land that some 38 years earlier, spies went in and said, man, this is too big for us. And the people freaked out and they didn't go in. So they have a memory of being fearful and failing at this moment. And God's like, look, be strong and very courageous. So is the thing that God is asking to you you into? Is it big? Yeah. Are you stepping outside of your comfort zone? Yeah. But God said, look, I'm going to be with you. And I think that that changes every situation. Do you realize that as a child of God, there's nowhere that you will be that God isn't there with you? He has promised his presence and God's presence is our power. God has promised his presence and God's presence is our power because it's his power that we get to walk in in Jesus' name. See, for Joshua, he gets reminded, listen, 
be strong. This people is, they're going to conquer the land and they're going to get to divide it up amongst them. Only be strong and very courageous. Why? That you observe to do according to all my law, which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. Then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. My friends, you want to get strengthened? Be somebody who walks in obedience to the word of God. There's nothing more freeing when you say, as far as I understand, everything in my life lines up to this. Because you know what happens when you're saying, when you're doing that, and if everything's going wrong, you say, Lord, as I understand in your word, I'm doing it the way you're asking me to do it. So what is going on? For a lot of you right now, the reason you are timid and fearful is because you know that your life is not lining up with what God's word says. There is something that you're doing. You've chosen to go to the right or to go to, or to, go to the left or to go to the right. And you know that there's something that's off. And because of that, that disobedience is now causing you to hesitate. And my counsel to you from the word of God is remove the disobedience and take a step of faith. Whatever that thing is, is it really worth missing out on what God wants to do in your life over? Is it really worth it? And I I say that acknowledging that there's been many, many, many times in my life where I've been in that place where I had to have a gut check on my life. Like, is it really worth it? Do I really want to give this thing up that is temporary and fleeting? Or do I want to step into it? I remember when God called me into the ministry, I was playing music professionally, and I'll never forget, the music thing was taken off. I was recording albums. I was on the road. I had gigs. It was like, I was living my dream. And when when that still small voice said, I've called you into the work of the ministry. I remember, I wrote in my journal, I think I'm called to be a pastor, but I don't want to go. Because I was living my dream. And I paused. What I didn't realize at the time was that my pause was driven by the fact that I built my identity on music, on being a musician. That it's like, I didn't know how to be a human being without being a professional musician. But God in his amazing way nudged me to take that step. I would never, I I think about it now, if had I never taken that step, I would have never met my wife Never had my beautiful kids. Never get to be here with you guys. I mean, you know, maybe I'd get to, if I found my way to Vancouver, Washington, I would be on the worship team, maybe, you know. But all sorts of things would have never happened. Will you be strong and very courageous and line your life up with God's word? Listen, taking the steps of faith to line your life up with God's word, it is a step of faith. Because the world's way says, do it this way. And God's word says, I want you to do it this way. But when you choose God's way, you experience the plan and purposes that God has. And I realize it is a step of faith. But everything in life is a step of faith. It depends on what you're trusting. So make sure your life lines up with God's word. Look what it says. I mean, let's not pretend it doesn't say this in the middle, at the end of verse 8. For then... You will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Now, is that what you guys want? You want your way to be prosperous? You want to have good success in the things of God? Absolutely. So take it at its word. Follow the word. Follow the book. That's why we teach it here. Don't teach my opinion. We teach the book. Because we know that when we line our lives up with God's word, God can do amazing things. And I love this, verse 9. Have I not commanded you? I was talking with Pastor Robbie, our youth pastor. I love Pastor Robbie so much. He's so fun. He said, God said, have I not commanded you? He said, son, I told you what it's supposed to be. That's how Pastor Robbie explained it to me. Son, I command, I I gave you the rules. Do it. So in Pastor Robbie's name, son, daughter, I gave you the rules. Do it. 
Be strong. Follow the word. And I love this. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Those are the opposites of being strong and courageous, right? Being afraid, being dismayed. He says, why? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, picking up in verse 10, look at what it says, because there's a couple things that need to be placed in order that need attention before they're allowed to cross over. First, it says, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, verse 11, pass through the camp and command the people, saying, prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Now, the first thing is they need to prepare provisions. Why? Because God's been feeding them them with this heavenly manna every single day except for the Sabbath day where they collect twice as much for almost 40 years and when they move into the promised land guess what he's going to stop that now that's important because what it means is God the way God provides for you will be situational and not forever now, that's hard for us isn't it because for some of us, we're so used to God doing this thing, all of a sudden he stops doing it like, God, where did you go? Listen, you got older, you grew up, you don't need the same things. Does that make sense? Like, I love my little Annabelle. She's three years old, right? She still wears a diaper to bed at night, right? Now, at three years old, that's normal. If my 12-year-old's still wearing diapers to bed at night, guess what? Houston, we have a problem. Now, oh, but I would be horrified if I didn't tell you he's not wearing diapers to bed. Okay, so he's rock solid. He knows where everything goes and he's got control over it all, right? If I'm wearing diapers to bed at night, guess what? Got a major problem. Now, things are working fine for me too, so I don't, I'm not there yet. You know what I mean? So, but for a three-year-old, that's okay. For a 12-year-old, not as good. For a 41-year-old, very, very bad. Now, I do realize maybe later you got to do it, right? And at that point, you say, Lord, thank you so much. You know, if you've made it to that point where you need to wear it again, praise God for a good long life. Amen? And I'm not making light of it. I know for some people you're in that space and you're like, dude, don't be making fun of that. You don't know what it's like. But listen, you're still around. So praise God. I was just talking to my, I always talk to my grandma and grandpa on my way to our Wednesday night service. Then my Wednesday night call. I always call him. My grandpa said, man, I'm 93. I don't think you're supposed to live to 93, but I'm going to have fun while I'm here. And it's funny, it's so cool. And I said to him, like, you want to FaceTime with the kids this weekend? He's like, I love it. You know I can't see him, but I love it anyway. <laughs> you know, and I love that attitude. He's like, look, he, he, my, my grandpa can't see. He's, he's legally blind. He wants to FaceTime with his great grandkids. He can't see them. He's like, but it's fun anyway. <laughs> he has no clue what's going on with it, but he loves it. So I say all that to say, we have to remember that God's provisions are unique. And the provision of manna was unique for the wilderness but it's going to stop. And he's like, so make sure you have provisions for when it stops. Also in verse 12, it says this. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. But you shall pass by before your brethren armed all your mighty men of valor and help them until the Lord has given your brethren rest as he gave you. And they also have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possessions and enjoy it which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave to you on this side of the Jordan toward the sunrise. And so if you recall... The tribe of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh were settling in on the side of the Jordan River that isn't the Promised Land. And they, they asked to stay there. And Moses said, yes, you can settle here. But when it's time to take the land, your wives and kids can stay in that land. But all the able-bodied men have to go to war. So even though you're settling on this side of the Jordan River, you need to make sure that you fulfill your commitment in conquering the land on the west side of the Jordan River, right? And so sure enough, they are reminded, we need, you need to make sure that you go on. And just as you have rest on the east side of the Jordan River, you need to help your brethren gain rest on the west side of the Jordan River. So there's a reminder of this. And then, of course, it says in verse 16, So they answered Joshua, saying, All that you command us we will do. 
And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. Now, this is the confirmation of Joshua as the next leader. Everybody says, look, all that you said, we will absolutely do. You are our leader. Now listen, all of us choose to follow different leaders. And I think the key is to make sure that whoever you follow is the person God has chosen for you. That's important. Because notice it says here, in them saying all this is like, just as we heeded Moses, we're going to heed you. And in the middle of verse 17, only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. See, if you're following a leader who's following the Lord, you're going to be fine. But if you're following a leader who isn't following the Lord, calamity is going to happen. So we want to make sure that if you're a leader, are you following the true leader who is Jesus? Because everybody follows leaders. And I love the fact they say only that the Lord your God be with you. And then verse 18, they say, whoever rebe rebels against the, your command and does not heed your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. So he's saying, look, you, just as Moses was, now you are. But I don't want you to miss the last seven words of this first chapter. Only be strong and of good courage. Now, what I think is beautiful about this, what I think is unbelievable about this, is that the Lord says to him over and over and over again, be strong and of good courage, right? So the Lord is encouraging Joshua to follow. And now as the children of Israel confirm that Joshua is the leader, what do they do? They encourage him to be strong and very courageous. Now listen, all of you, listen to me. God wants you to encourage other people to walk in the strength of the Lord with good courage. You are created in Christ to encourage one another to be strong and of good courage. The people of God are at their best when we provoke one another to love and good works. When we remind people who the Lord is and what He does and how he works. Because if we do not encourage one another to be strong and of good courage, many of us will choose fear and be dismayed and not take the steps. I'll be honest with you. One of the things I love so much about our Crossroads family is how encouraging our family is. Like, as one of your pastors, the number of times someone will grab me and say, Listen, you keep going. You trust the Lord. You do what God is asking you to do. We believe that God's on the move. As a leader, sometimes you're like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. and Maybe I'm screwing this whole thing up. And maybe I'm out to lunch. And, you know, and, and when someone comes and speaks to you in that way, not about who you are, but about who the Lord is and how the Lord could use anybody, now all of a sudden you're edified. That's what the Bible calls it. You're built up. You're strengthened. And brothers and sisters, we live in a day and age where faith is faltering. I mean, Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he indeed find faith on the earth? The believers, people who love Jesus, have decided to be people who don't build one another up, but people who tear one another down. That when someone is struggling, instead of saying, God is strong and almighty and God can work. We have a tendency to be like, hey, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't trust God in that, man. God doesn't work the way he used to work. We live in a day and age where doubt is being championed as a virtue. Not in our Bibles, it isn't. What's championed in our Bible is faith and the strength and the power and the perfect plans of the almighty God. Brothers and sisters, Encourage one another to be strong and very courageous. Encourage one another to follow Jesus and simply respond to Him. When someone's taking a bold step of faith, let them know that you're praying for them. 
and pray for them. When you see someone who God is using, you come alongside them and you help them along. And when you see someone who God isn't using, but you know God has tremendous potential in them, you come alongside them just the way Aaron and her came alongside Moses and you lift up that person's arm so that they would become the person that God created them to be. As I was, I had studied this whole chapter, been praying over it for weeks. And today, as I reread the chapter, my last few times before coming out here, I didn't even notice the last seven words. It was like, you know, it's kind of like I missed it. I got to the end. It was like I was at the end of the thing. I got it. But I was like, no. This chapter closes with the people saying, be who God made you to be. And I think all of us need to hear that over and over and over again because we forget. So brothers and sisters, be strong and very courageous. The Lord your God is with you. Should bow our heads and our hearts and pray together. Father, I'm so excited that we get to study the book of Joshua together. And Father, as we see now a new leader stepping into the role of leading your people into the promised land, Joshua, that great picture of Jesus doing what the law and religion could never do. Lord, we see this encouragement over and over and over again to be strong and of great courage, to follow your word, to step into the inheritance, what you have already given your kids that they could experience it, to step on in. But they had to take that step and Joshua had to lead them. And God, I ask that because your, you've promised us your presence and your presence is our power, will you cause us as your children today to be strong and very courageous? That all of us would simply respond to you. That we would take those steps. That we would be unafraid to step out with you because you have promised to be with us. And Father, I ask that you would give us the simple faith of children to say yes to you. At every step. Whether we've been walking with you for many, many decades or whether we're going to begin walking with you tonight. Let us learn your trustworthiness as we take you as your word and we step on out. You know, and now with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you're here, whether you're here in our sanctuary in Vancouver or in our Portland sanctuary or if you're with us online, if you've never before said yes to Jesus, if you've never allowed Jesus to take his God-given place in your life, you've never allowed him to share his perfections with you, his righteousness and his holiness. Maybe you're here today and you've been trying to to make God happy with you by the way that you're acting or the things that you're doing. And you're hearing it's not about what we do, it's about what Jesus has done. And it's not about our good works, but it's about God being pleased in Jesus. And when we say yes to Jesus, God is pleased at us because Jesus is in us. And you're saying, I want Jesus in me because I want God's pleasure to be in my life. And I want my sins forgiven. And I want to know that no matter where I am, God's presence is with me because He has promised it. And that that presence is my power because Jesus is with me. And if that's you, I want you to take a few steps of faith with me here tonight. First, if you're saying yes to Jesus, we just raise your hand. Just put your hand up high. Just say it's me. I'm saying yes to Jesus right here, right now. Raise your hand up high. God bless you. I see you right there in the center of the sanctuary there. Praise God. Keep your hand up high there. Anybody else? Just raise your hand up to say, it's me. I'm saying yes to Jesus here. I see you right there in the back row as well. Almost the back row. I see you there with your hand up. Praise God. If you're part of our Facebook Live or our internet campus, if you're saying yes to Jesus, I want you to write as a comment, I'm giving my heart to Jesus right now. And I want you to hit send. And our pastors and hosts online, they want to follow up with you just as we would if you were here in the Crossroads Sanctuary. Now for those of you who raised your hand, I want you to raise your hand up one more time just so we can see you. Because in a moment I'm going to pray and then some of our pastors, they're going to come over, they're going to talk with you right in your seat. But I want you to make sure that that you have your hand up so these guys know they're going to come on over. They're going to want to be able to talk with you and pray with you specifically about the work that God is doing in your life right now. So, Father, we ask tonight that for people who are saying yes to you for the very first time, 
as we connect with them, God, that you would help them to be strong and very courageous. Lord, that you would allow them to walk with you, empowered by your spirit. And Father, that we would see your glory on display in their lives. Lord, make us all strong and of good courage. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And all of God's family said, amen, amen. Brothers, let's all stand together. And those of you who raised your hand, uh, Pastor Tim and Pastor Stuart, they're gonna come over and they're gonna talk with you guys. We're gonna invite the servers to come forward with the elements of communion. As we always do here on a Wednesday evening, we have the elements of communion available. The bread, which is symbolic of the blood of Jesus, of the body of Jesus that was broken on the cross. The cup symbolic of Jesus' blood that was shed. It says in the Bible that without the shedding of blood, there is no 